So yeah, I'm Sarah. Um, probably most of you here know me. I am a VR creator and designer. Um, since 2013, when I got my hands on an Oculus Rift DK1. I am a very strong advocate for human-centric approaches when it comes to creating meaningful VR content. And I'm actually German and located in Berlin, but I am currently in Montreal. Um, but today, I really want to take the time we have here together to give the word to my partners and speakers that came together for this event edition of our event series, um, together with the Goethe Institute Montreal um, that I started or I initiated this year in March together with Tatiana from the Goethe Institute just before COVID-19 hit. Um, but yeah, I'm also a co-founder of Women in Immersive Technologies and with Women in Immersive Tech, we were hosting regular meetups in Altspace VR um, since COVID-19 didn't allow us anymore to continue our physical events. And this series, this event series, is especially aiming at international and intercultural exchange with women working with immersive technologies in Canada and the North American region. Um, but at Women in Immersive Technologies, I'm of course not alone. Um, I quickly want to introduce to you my co-founders, um, Joanna Matai. I'm calling her a wonder woman here because she's juggling so many things. Um, and most of all, she's also basically a, a bouncer, I would call her, to make sure we are really all having a safe space here and we can have our meetup undisturbed. Um, Lane is also in this space. She's a co-founder of Women in Immersive Tech and she's also the CEO and founder uh, of LucidWeb, which is a white label platform for 360 videos, VR and AR. And also want to quickly introduce Vera. She is in the Zoom today, and I also want to welcome everyone that is joining our meetup from the Zoom because they cannot make it into the real space. And yeah, today we are having the third edition of our meetup series. And as I said, I don't want to steal much more time, but I really, really want to thank our amazing partners um, and all of these organizations that really help, helped and helped making this event a success and bringing the people together that we want to bring together. So thank you everyone for supporting us and for being part. I also saw some familiar faces that were here at meetups before. It's really great to see that people are coming together through this. And um, we are going, just before I'm going to jump into the introductions, I just want to make sure um, to be able to really give our speakers and presenters the attention they deserve. I would ask everyone to please mute their microphones during the formal part of this event. We will definitely have the opportunity for conversations and networking and exchange after the presentations and the performance. And if you have questions after each of the presentations, they're also very welcome. Um, please either use the hand raise function in your right lower corner or you raise the hand if you're in a VR headset, just like that. And we will then amplify your voice so everyone can hear you loud and clear in the space. Um, yeah, so we're gonna have a round of introductions um, by Tatiana and Randy Vergara. So Tatiana is a program curator at the Goethe Institute Montreal and the person, as I said, I'm co-organizing this event together with. Um, Tatiana, once again, a big thank you for making all of this happen and thank you so much for all your enthusiasm about VR and your constant support with the curation and direction for this event series. And I really want to thank you most of all for supporting this initiative with your invaluable input around diversity, inclusion, and accessibility while using cutting edge, edge technology to connect over borders and enable exchange in these difficult times. Um, that is really big and courageous and very much needed while we have to pause our physical get-togethers. and. I think by now I actually know your VR you even better than your real life self, but hopefully 
times are going to change and we can actually build on what we are establishing in this virtual context also outside of VR. Um, thank you, Tatiana. Yeah. Um, the stage is yours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this beautiful introduction. Um, Oops, I have to, like I'm using the quest for the first time, I'm moving around. If I move around weirdly, <laughs> <laughs> please excuse this. Um, yeah, I want, yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah Lisa, for this um, kind and, and great introduction. Um, I'm, I'm also, yeah, as she said, I'm, I'm a program curator at the Goethe Institute in Montreal. And uh, together with Sarah Lisa, we are very happy to um, initiate this meetup and to welcome you all to, uh, for this third episode of Connect Women in Immersive Tech. And um, yes, before going into a quick presentation of today's uh, focus, um, I just wanted to, yeah, just, uh, and because it's the last um, uh, meetup for this year, um, I wanted to say thanks a lot to Zara Lisa and um, for, because basically all you see, all you see in this space um, is, Sarah Lisa's work, um, yeah, All Space VR has those but preset it's not, rooms. It's not but my work. <laughs> oh yeah, but a, like you, you, yeah, I know. But you, of course, but you arrange, you decorate the room, and now with All Space having disabled the easy way of also implementing presentations, you basically code all the presentations into this space, and this is really. This is really amazing and yeah, I want to acknowledge that and um, yeah, please um, let the let the emojis rain. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Great, thank um, you so much, Tatiana. <laughs> Yeah, and, and of course, I also want to thank um, our partners um, from Women in Immersive Tech who run, as Sarah Lisa said, the whole thing um, uh, smoothly in the background and also our partners from uh, Felix and Paul Studios who are always involved and always, um, yeah, taking care that everything runs smoothly in the back. So it's, it's really, it's really great working with you. And I also would like to thank yeah, our other communications partners um, that Sarah Lisa also already mentioned, EdaX, SICAM, and um, also the um, uh, Bavarian representation in Quebec. And uh, yes, so today's um, today's meetup focuses around um, topics that are related to our year-long uh, project New Nature, which is an initiative by the Goethe Institute with support of the federal um, Ministry um, of Germany, and um, I, and it's a, it's an, it's an, it's, it's an international exchange uh, between uh, filmmakers, um, immersive, and we are cre create creatives um, between climate scientists and technologists, and it fosters exchange and uh, also and um, exchange of knowledge, but also aims at changing our way about how we speak, how we, how we communicate around and about nature and also climate change. And um, this new nature project initiative started out, kicked off in May with a conference and um, continued with a, um, the awarding of research and development grants and different public events such as an exhibition happening right now in Berlin and in Montreal at the same time and later this year in New York and also a film screening and uh, artist talks. Um, yes, and today's speakers, um, Tosca Teran, um, Tamiko Thiel and also Zara Lisa are all New Nature participants and I just saw some participants in the room, I think too. Um, and they are all, they have all been awarded with the research and development grants too. And um, yes, so I'm very proud and very happy um, to have you here. And um, yes, over to Zara Lisa. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And um, this time I didn't bring the flowers because uh, there was a little incident with not being able to grab them. So I'm just going to move forward to Randy. 
Uh, Randy, I'm really, really happy to have you here today. And um, just as a small introduction to know who she is, um, Randy Vergara is a curator and researcher. She reads and writes on media and contemporary art. She has also organized and produced a number of exhibitions in various institutions, ranging from museums to media art to artist-run centers and other nonprofit spaces. She has been the coordinator of Studio X, former Studio XX, now Ada X programming from September 2015 to 2017. And she was the artistic director of the festival HTML's Conditions of Confidentiality in 2016. Her main research interests include feminism, world studies and art history, curator curatorial studies, post-colonialism, and critical studies on race issues. Thank you so much for coming and for setting the stage for our upcoming speed up speakers and for this meetup. And uh, yeah, take it away, Randy. The stage is yours. Great. Okay, awesome. great. thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for being here today. Thanks to the Goethe Institute for inviting me uh, to this awesome presentation along artists I really admire. I'm really honored to be here with Tessa uh, Belgo and Tamiko Thiel. And uh, I couldn't be happier to uh, be discussing these issues um, in the actual context that we are all uh, living with this global pandemic. So, um, so what I'm going to do today is um, quick, uh, quickly make three points to introduce the theme and share some thoughts about what immersion means today. Um, and so, I'm going to talk about new nature and what those. Well, and what it means today. Uh, I'm also going to talk about immersion in the midst of a global pandemic. And then I'm going to share some uh, thoughts about speculative cultures and, and uh, speculative feature, features and how we see ourselves in the near future. And so, um, as um, Sarah uh, mentioned, I am an independent creator and I recently uh, was programming director of ICEA 2020. And the theme uh, for this year's symposium uh, is uh, was uh, why sentience. And the idea that we wanted to explore was uh, the ability to feel or perceive uh, how it's not an exclusively human uh, quality. And uh, this theme became all the more relevant when the uh, pandemic started. And as it had evolved, uh, we evolve with the organization of the event. And uh, can you go back, please, to the oh, previous slide? Uh, oh, is there another? There should be another one with the flowers. No, no flowers. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. No sorry, flowers. No sorry, worries. Sorry. So maybe. Sorry. No worries. Uh, let's. Uh, so the first point I want to make today is about the idea of rewilding in notions of nature, which is the title of my presentation. And so um, the main questions here are, what does nature mean today? How has the COVID-19 pandemic transformed the binary nature culture and the assumption that the former is subjugated to the later? So we have seen images um, here my slide that you can't see, but the idea I had was that all these images of animals rewildening uh, cities, uh, goats in the UK, birds in Montreal, uh, monkeys and, and babuinos, uh, baboons in uh, Thailand, and how different species and plants start taking over the cities when we were forced into lockdown. So the idea I want to, um, um, the point I want to make here is uh, with the idea of rewilding in notions of nature is uh, when we were forced into our homes, uh, we free up the space that we normally occupy as though we are the only living beings that matter. And so this is not new. If you're familiar with literature in different uh, disciplines, we know that uh, there have been years of uh, scholarship interrogating anthropogenic uh, uh, perspectives. But I feel that the widespread belief and practices of exploitation are, and consumptions, uh, how the majority of people live our lives with little respect for other beings and the planet, is, it is uh, a, a reality. Um, 
But so what I'm talking about here is that discursive space, not a discursive space, but a condition of being and doing things that for the first time humans have to change. Uh, we were forced to change how we see ourselves because of this global pandemic. And so um, for the first time, what we have is not theories about the human as not the center of the world, but an actual proof that we are not the center. And so um, we are, for the first time, all of us sharing, um, living in a uh, living from a position of discomfort, from a position of our desires that are blocked, uh, where we cannot go out, where we can't see friends, where we cannot see our friends and family where we cannot do what we want the way we want it. And so each of us will experience uh, life as a series of I cannot, I cannot. Um, and so this idea I draw from Sarah Hammett's uh, orientations and the idea uh, that uh, marginalized groups, for instance, experience the world as a series of uh, blockages and uh, as a series of I cannot claims and this is in high contrast with the idea of I can uh, brought by uh, phenomenologists and this is a universalized idea that assumes that everybody experiences the world on equal grounds and so the point I want to make with this is that the COVID-19 virus debunked all the grandiosity uh, myths that humans have built around ourselves and return us to a vulnerable position and so I see this as an opportunity to see nature uh, from this place of discomfort, from this place of I cannot. Uh, and so from this place, we are reminded quite literally that we can die, that we as many other species are um, vulnerable. And so this is nature, I think, in 2020. And again, this is not a discursive position. This is something that became quite clearly to every one of us. And so um, so the COVID uh, virus turned the mirror to ourselves and questioned this conception of nature as, as something out there that we encounter when we go out for a hike. And so where we have to see now is that we're small, that we can die, and also, and very interestingly, that life goes on. Uh, even if humans are at home, even if we were to disappear, new life will grow. Just as new flowers were born in streets and gardens uh, when the lockdown started, and just as uh, animals start taking over the spaces we uh, assume and took as ours on exclusively, and so. Um, I see this, uh, the new conceptions of nature are flourishing, uh, and such conceptions might be oriented towards equality in the sense that an equal vulnerability to life, to live and die, uh, is evident to us. And again, not as that theory, but as something that we are seeing every day. So the second point, uh, and now is the time for the slide, please. Yeah, I'm, so I'm the, so sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, but in my images were great of animals just populating cities and, and turtles being born in Mexico and uh, um, monkeys um, going into cities in Thailand, not a fun thing. There were a lot of fake news, but anyway, some of them are legit. And so the second point is about rethinking, persisting, avoiding immersion. And so when with the first uh, with the lockdowns that have happened around the world since uh, February, what we have seen is security measures and uh, physical forms of restrictions, uh, restrictions about getting together, uh, but also doing our day to day life. Um, we have also seen an increased number of online exhibitions and different programming uh, that have to have had to reinvent itself uh, to present, to bring contact to people who are not unable to uh, visit uh, movie theaters, uh, museums, libraries, and other uh, places we used to. Even events in public space have been banned in many, many cities. And, um, or we have to improvise and uh, 
program events that we cannot announce. So all of these conditions are shaping the way we produce content. Uh, we are also experiencing, and you might know about this a lot, quarantine fatigue, we are talking about Zoom fatigue, uh, hours of computers and meetings and, and teleconference events. And uh, we all experience special and mental saturation. I hear a lot of my friends saying we need a break from all of this. And so with these ideas, with this reality that we are living now, I want Quick key question I think that all of us have to ask and have been asked as well is how do we invite people to invest their time in yet another virtual event, in yet another Zoom event? And um, and so here I want to mention, and um, if you want to please uh, show the next slide, thank you. So when I was preparing ICS, yeah, so uh, uh, this was supposed to be an, in May. We had to adapt the event and uh, postpone it to October 13 to the 18 in Montreal. And uh, we had selected a series of 35 installations. We had seven venues, and then we just have to go online. And the big problem was that most of the uh, pieces we had selected were installations. So how? Uh, do you translate that? How can you make that an, an interesting experience where uh, the theme was way sentience and many of the work involved different senses, smell, taste, uh, and also just the, 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 the experience of the body in the space uh, to experience works that involve, for instance, uh, mist. And, and so there's no way, there is no system uh, virtual system that can transform this experience successfully. Uh, and so we, when we were preparing the, the uh, exhibitions, uh, I got an interview and someone asked me a very interesting question that I want to share with you. Um, I was asked how we were going to deal with embodiment. And my answer was, we are not, we per se are not going to deal with embodiment, but uh, participants, uh, I say delegates are because they are tired and they, they will feel their bodies and they are already or invitation with um, four intensive days of conference running 12 hours per day in three live stream, parallel live stream. So this enormous amount of hours that we were requesting from spectators. And so the question of embodiment is not how we as context providers are going to deal with that, but how each one of us is, is dealing already with embodiment in a, in a very unprecedented way. We were known about theories of cramped bodies, overweighted bodies, passive uh, bodies in, in, in computer sitting, but uh, what we have to live with now is uh, it's, it goes beyond that. And so what I want to say today is that we, given all of this um, reality, we have to rethink immersion. We are avoiding and resisting when we can to be immersed. Because for most of us, uh, many online interaction and immersive experience uh, are not a choice. So when we do have a choice, we disengage. Um, and so next slide, please. I'd like to discuss with you one of the works we selected for ISEA and that uh, became all the more relevant in, in March when the first lockdown uh, was uh, ordered here in Montreal. This is a VR piece, the title is Hyper T, and uh, the experience is uh, living in a 1.5 by 2 meter long space. It's a tiny confined space where um, you as the VR user are um, listening to news about uh, a climate catastrophe and uh, uh, a, a world where the uh, plastic pollution has got to a point that uh, the air is toxic and you cannot go out. And so uh, as the VR user, you are in this tiny space and the only interaction you have with the outside world is through the news. 
and then you can look through the window. And so I, when I look at this piece, we like it, but then one month later, it was all the more relevant. And this feeling of um, this feeling uh, we experienced in the VR then felt, felt very real when we were um, forced into uh, our homes. And so um, the third point I want to make, and next slide, please. It's a uh, speculative features and uh, the main point is that humans are just one more among other vulnerable species. Um, since the early 2000s, there has been research about the crumb about crumpet overweighted and sore bodies of the network network era. Now our bodies are constantly being present to ourselves because of the discomfort we experience, the mental and physical fatigue of hours and hours in front of screens without homes and engaging in face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, we as content and context providers have to face the fact that our embodied experience of the pandemic has transformed our desires to be connected and to be immersed into virtual worlds. We have to allow this discomfort to bring us to creating different virtual spaces and forms of connectivity. Um, and we might have to accept looking away and disengagement as necessary forms of engagement with art and racial culture. Um, those are my thoughts for today. I'd love to continue this discussion after Teran and uh, Tamiko's presentations. Thank you. Um, we want to move forward with the presentation. I was just wondering if anyone had a question to Arandi um, right at that point, but um, we can also do that afterwards. If anyone should have a question right now, feel free to, to ask. Okay, otherwise we're gonna move forward to the presentations and we're gonna have a presentation by Tamiko and then a presentation by Tosca. And then we're also gonna have a live performance um, by Tosca coming after that. So first of all, Tamiko. I'm very, very happy Tamiko can be here today. Um, I did a workshop with Tamiko in 2017 where she showed me a couple of AI things at the Munich Creators Lab, so I'm a big fan. Um, and Tamiko Thiel is an American artist known for her digital art. Her work often explores the interplay of place, space, the body, and cultural identity and uses augmented reality as her platform. Tamiko is based in Munich, Germany, and her artwork um, for the last 15 years has focused on site-specific virtual reality installations. Her work has been displayed in international venues, including the International Center of Photography, the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, the ZKM in Karlsruhe, the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography, Ars Electronica, SIGGRAPH, ICEA, and many more. So you see there's a lot going on, and she does this not only since yesterday. Um, Thiel's artwork is often utilizing augmented reality as a platform and uses lay AR and augmented reality viewer. Um, so her works have been layered also over locations such as the New York Stock Exchange, the Tate Museum in London, the New York Museum of Modern Art, the Berlin Wall, the Piazza San Marco in Venice, and many other locations. So thank you so much, Tamiko, for being here and for coming. Um, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? And is my voice loud enough? Yeah, I can hear you great. Uh -huh, okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much, um, New Nature, for, um, for inviting me to to join everyone here and especially Sarah Lisa for all the work you put in and Tatiana for all the work you put in. Let's go to the next slide. I think I have to wrap up, unwrap my cable a little bit here. Um, so so uh, let's go to directly to the next slide and I'll start talking about the new nature project that um, is bringing me here. So I'm part of a, a team that got a grant from New Nature. Um, I've been an XR artist since 1994, and uh, my husband Peter Graf has been an XR developer, a software developer since 1995. And in this project, 
seeing the imperceptible, visualizing microbial communities in Bacala stromatolites, we've teamed up with Professor Luisa Ifalcon, who's a marine microbiologist at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Next slide, please. So, so um, uh, Luisa is located in uh, Bacalar, which is a town in the, the Yucatan, and in this inset that I'm probably blocking with my avatar, uh, you see that the Bacalar is a very long, thin lagoon, and also a city of the same name, a town of the same name on that lagoon. Next slide, please. And it's known, Bacala uh, is known for its stromatolites, and these look like rocks, like dead rocks, but they're not actually uh, dead at all. They're living accretions of cyanobacteria and other microbial lights. And these uh, cyanobacteria are, um, or they're responsible for the oxygen in the atmosphere that we breathe. Uh, they're the oldest fossils we've ever found of life on Earth. And apparently about two billion years ago, they started, they somehow developed the ability to photosynthesize. They take carbon dioxide out of the, the water. Carbon dioxide dissolves into the water and the oceans are actually the largest carbon sink. Um, and they extract it out of the water and with the sun's energy, they photosynthesize, creating nutrients and also producing the oxygen that, that we need to survive. Uh, next slide, please. So there's, um, uh, for a number of years, I've been fascinated by these cycles of the elements, which really underlie the processes we need on Earth to stay alive. And it turns out that um, the, I came upon the stromatolites and the cyanobacteria that, that make it and have been really wanting to integrate them into a project. And then in the New Nature project, I met Luisa Falcon, who's an expert in the topic. So this is one of her slides overlaid with the Lewis diagrams that I like to use to depict the types of molecules that are involved in these processes. So, so these are all invisible processes. They're, they're elements and gases that we can't actually see directly. And these stromatolites uh, accrete when the uh, cyanobacteria photosynthesize uh, uh, and the carbon is deposited as calcium uh, carbonate onto these rock-like structures. So if people clamber over them, um, because the, the top layer, the top, uh, I think, five millimeters or so uh, of, of the str uh, stromatolites are actually living cyanobacteria and uh, other microbialites. They also do nitrogen uh, fixing uh, also from the atmosphere to provide nutrients. So next slide, please. So uh, so the question that both Luisa had and I, I had um, independently before we met each other is how can we make these invisible processes that are so important to sustain life on the planet that are really at the basis of all of our talk about, about uh, too much carbon in the atmosphere and the carbon acidifying the water, which then will do things, for instance, like start dis dissolving the calcium carbonate of the stromatolite structure. Uh, I came up from the, uh, uh, I, I knew about the Lewis structures from my high school chemistry and really loved them always for depicting uh, how the atoms combine together with their valence electrons, the little dots between the, uh, the, the atoms to form the molecules that are really part of life. So uh, we're, we're banding together to, uh, and, and discussing strategies of making these invisible processes visible in a number of different pieces, whether they be AR or VR or mixed reality. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a project that I had started uh, before meeting Luisa. Um, actually, let's go straight to the video. And um, and it I call it elemental spaces, and it has uh, a real component where you would have four bowls of uh, each one holding some of uh, a real element, and by holding the ball a bowl in your real hands in the virtual world, you see then, uh, for instance, here uh, the person has held the energy bowl with a black black and coal in their hands. The photons are streaming down. Um, of course, it's only when there's sunlight that we can see the water as being blue. And so it's uh, the sunlight is allowing the world to turn blue. And then as more uh, energy streams down, then the, uh, the cyanobacteria will, will arise. 
and start turning the water green and start producing oxygen. And once the oxygen it was produced, you know, before the um, cyanobacteria started producing free oxygen, uh, there weren't, there was not, there was no fire. Fire needs uh, free oxygen in order to to burn. So at some point, you'll see fire jumping up from the coal. So all of these processes are extremely uh, related. And uh, here you see the cyanobacteria fading in and producing the oxygen. So if you can imagine uh, um, these sorts of imagery, these sorts of interactions, and uh, these sorts of depictions of of the gases are things that we will use in the uh, projects that come out of this. Let's actually go on um, uh, to, uh, let's skip over this and go directly to the end video because I think, um, uh, yeah, and let's run this video. Um, so this is an earlier work from 2016. It was a commission from the Seattle Art Museum, but here I'm in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, because uh, in the original uh, project Gardens of the Anthropocene, I started uh, finding out about the uh, toxic red algae, which it turns out are really appearing on all the coastal areas around the world. And when the uh, as the waters get warmer, um, they are really very quite, uh, very happy and start multiplying. And they're of course microscopic, like all these mi microbial and algae uh, bacteria. Um, that we're addressing in, in this project. So here I make them huge so that you can see what they look like when they're making their algal bloom. And for instance, uh, just a year or so ago, the entire coastline or most of the coastline of Florida was um, hit by an algal bloom which lasted almost a year. So usually it's just like maybe a couple of weeks or maybe a month. This lasted through the, the year. Can you imagine Florida with no coastline? I mean, it was not just that you couldn't swim in the water, you couldn't walk on the beach because there was so much algae that it would wash up, of course, with the water onto the beach, dry out on the beach, and then come into the atmosphere. And people, uh, especially if they had problems with allergies, would, would breathe it and get sick. So this is the sort of future that's waiting for us if we, um, if we ignore the balances of nature that we are uh, at the moment with our fossil fuels and um, with our consumptive, uh, consumption patterns really bringing out of balance. So I th uh, so you might be able to imagine, for instance, if we're on the uh, side of the Bacalar Lagoon, then we'll yeah. we'd be using a similar yeah. sort of if so. effect with, uh, with AR, where you would see then the stromatolites and you would see the gases that they are that, that they are cycling cycling in and out of, of of the environment. So I'm going to leave it at that because I want to uh, I really want to see Tosca's performance. Uh, but thank you very <laughs> much for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much, Tamiko. Um, that was really great. Um, now I don't have a slide in between us. Oh. This is the video. I'm just going to leave it over here in case there should still be um, any questions uh, for your presentation that uh, people would want to ask right now. Um, can can you hear me still? Yep. Yeah. Yes, okay. Great. You. Um, okay, awesome. So, so if there aren't any questions right now, Tosca, um, Tamiko is also going to stick around until after Tosca's uh, presentation, and um, and you can talk to her afterwards. So, then we're going to go forward, and um, Tosca, we're not going to only have a presentation by her, but after her presentation, she's also going to play for us live. Um, a biodata sonification performance um, of mycelial networks between reality. And I just briefly want to introduce her. So Tosca Hello. is an interdisciplinary artist working at the intersection of art and ecology. Through developing bodies of incorporating metal, glass, and electronics, Tosca received scholarships from the Corning Museum of Glass um, Pilcher Glass School and others, and her work has been featured at SOFA New York, Culture Canada, Urban Glass Brooklyn, Music Works Magazine, and many more. And Tuska has been awarded several artist residencies, for example, at the Icelandic Visual Arts Association in Reykjavik, 
And also in 2019, Tosca was one of the first bio artists in residence at the Museum of Com Contemporary Art, Toronto, in partnership with the Ontario Science Centre, as well as a recipient of the 2019 Big CI Enver Environmental Award at Volumi National Park with the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, Tosca also founded Nanopod, a hybrid studio maker space in 2015, continue, continually exploring new materials and tools. Tosca started collaborating artistically with Alchi, Fusarium polycephalum, and mycelium in 2016, translating biodata from non human organisms into music. Sorry about the, uh, my spelling problems with um, the. Fusarium polycephalum. Maybe you can say how it's how Fusarium it's polycephalum. Can you guys hear okay. me? It's yeah. also known as slime mold. Ah, <laughs> so thanks. thank you so much, uh, Sarah Lisa. And I want to thank the Gitta and definitely Women in Immersive Technology for inviting me to this. Um, okay. And so you can hear me. Yes. I just got a yeah. little pop up saying something. Okay, so I guess let's go into the slides. Um, I'm kind of a little amped up because I am going to be performing here. There's some mycelium sitting in front of me by my Eurorack module all ready to roll. I'll talk about that. So I've been um, for a very long time. I've been very interested in working with non human elements uh, like this, like slime mold, Physarum polycephalum and mycelium. Um, if you're not familiar with what mycelium is, it's also kind of known as mushroom roots. It's what we don't see, like if you look outside in this virtual forest, uh, it would be probably growing underneath all these trees and once a wall thick, but it can be kilometers, hectares in size. Next slide, please. So, um, in 2019, um, I, you can see, I'm trying to point here. <laughs> Uh, this large sculptural piece um, that happened at the Gladstone Hotel in Toronto. So this is a mycelium sculpture. It's living. It's in a bag because I promised uh, this is a heritage kind of hotel that um, it wouldn't spore or anything like that. But really, it was to protect the mycelium from contaminants from the people that would be coming into the space. And so what people could do is they could walk within this area um, and they could touch some copper plates that are in front. So it's a galvanic response and it's going through the fungi and the lit up aspects on the side are bio data sonification modules that um, I create that what they do is they take micro fluctuations in conductivity and they translate this into MIDI notes and controls. Um, so people were hearing a mycelium made soundscape that they could also use their bio data to influence. Next slide, please. Um, and then also last year, um, as Sarah Lisa said, I was one of the first bio artists in residence at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And that was in partnership with the Ontario Science Center. So for that, um, I built a mycelium Martian dome. Um, and what I did is I did a geodesic dome here and I grew mycelium in between some of the negative spaces. I only had uh, like the residency overall was three months long. Um, and then after conceptualizing this and researching it, I had pretty much less than two months. So I worked with Ganoderma lucidum, which is also known as reishi, and it grew and tends to grow super fast. Um, there's also pictures over here on the glass. Um, there's a, a scanning electron microscope image here where you can see it looks like a honeycomb. Uh, that was taken last year at Carleton University. I went up there and that is Ganoderma lucidum. And the more you scan in, the more you realize it's actually a fractal. So there was also a biosonification component in there as well uh, that people can interact with. Next slide, please. Apologies, I'm going so fast. Um, so I'm super honored uh, to have received an R&D grant uh, from the New Nature Project. Sarah Lisa, myself, uh, neuroscientist, media artist, Brendan Lehman, and uh, robotics, animatronics, and Arduino programmer Lorena Salome are all collaborating 
on um, a mixed reality experience where uh, fungal biodata will influence the VR aspect of this mixed reality. And uh, outside of it, within the installation in the physical space, people will also be able to interact with different sculptural um, items that will be kind of representing microbial life and things like this and the fungus. And um, I don't know what's next. There might be a little video. We uh, took part in Dames Making Games and Trinity Square video uh, residency this summer so we could kind of do a first kind of iteration of uh, conceptual verification. <laughs> yeah, here and we here go. is the video. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so um, test subjects came in and got to go into the space recreated and actually so we had six test subjects and four of these subjects had never entered a VR kind of situation before. So mycelium was sending data into the VR space and when the humans would touch trees and plants and things like this, uh, the fungus would respond and create sounds and things like that. So I don't know what the next slide might be. Um, the next slide is actually going in. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah. next year, um, I'm already working on this. I'm creating a, a seven and a half month long bio data sonification called Forest Undersound that will be taking place at the museum in Kitchener, Ontario. Um, and it's going to be interesting. A lot of different types of mycelium will be hooked up and biosonifying throughout like kind of the seasons and as they grow and things like this. And also the mycorrhizal rhythm machine will be happening at NYSA, which is also in Ontario. It's new adventures in sound art and people will be able to hopefully uh, these are happening. Well, Forest Under Sound starts up in January 2021 and will be on display until uh, September. And the mycorrhizal rhythm machine is taking place in June, and I hope at that point people will be able to touch things because they're very interactive and mycelium knows when you're present, knows when you're there, and does respond, and you can hear this uh, audio visual things taking place. So with that, I'm going to jump out and I'm, we're going to live stream performance now. I'm going to show you with the camera. Um, I'm going to move it around so you can see the mycelium uh, hooked up with electrodes to biosonification modules where that's going into the Euro rack. Then I'm going to set the camera down so I can start performing with the mycelium. And thank you so much. And I apologize for <laughs> my rapid fire kind of no, uh, discombobulation. Uh, thank you so okay, much, Jessica, well, for thank your you presentation. And also, I'm go if anyone here. has a question, um, right now, we before Tosca uh, okay. basically uh, retreats to the balcony to be present in our live stream, um, feel free to ask questions um, at this point or after her set. Yeah, okay. So, thank you, everybody, and I will see you shortly. I'm going up here. Thank you. Take up my headset. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, um, this performance, uh, as Tosca said already, it's a uh, uh, live. That, uh, it's a live <laughs> stream uh, from basically her studio, uh, live biodata sonification, and uh, the title is Mycelia Networks Between Reality. I'm just making sure that the live stream is actually playing. There we go. And there we already see the reishi in the live stream. Just going to turn the volume up and then we'll see when she comes in. Okay, I think we're going to give her some minutes. Um, and after her presentation, after her performance, we then also have the time for usual networking and get together where we can all exchange and talk about all the inputs we were just getting, but also feel free to have some conversations now until the performance is starting. And we're just going to see that she's ready and coming. Thank you, John. Yeah. yeah, is that you, Olivia? Yeah, it's it's nice your voice. So we didn't want to talk to her about this. We don't have good sound isolation. Can you hear me at all? 
performance had started. Yeah, the performance has started. Thank you.
now I was on mute. Um, I think that might be it. I think the screen stopped. Oh, yeah, Did you hear it? Oh, she's Thank bang. You so much. Yeah, perfect. Can you hear me? Whew. Yeah. Oh, awesome. oh, thank you. That yeah. So very cool. Very, very cool. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Uh, Whew. Same. <laughs> I've never done that before.